If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm here in studio with our Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Steve, as usual, always great to have you here. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Steve has done some outstanding research on early church history. And, uh, of course, if you think you can do a better job than him, then feel free to check the sites uh, that are available on the Internet. Uh, there's publishers that uh, also make early church writers uh, writings available for research. In fact, Steve, take a moment as we do a lot of times to let people know where they can find this early church history for themselves. Okay, uh, you can look at, at the research that I've done and also the, the quotes backing it up at www.historycars.com slash church history. Uh, you can actually read all the church, uh, most of, of the pre-Nicene writers for yourselves at another site, www.ccel. Uh, dot org, which has them there, or you can read them in printed form. I recommend you uh, get the the ten volume book uh, books of the Anti Nicene Fathers. This is one of the volumes. Uh, they're by Hendricks, Hendrickson Publishers, uh, and 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 they just have all the writings in here in you know pretty dense print. Um, so uh, so everything I say that can be backed up and you can you know, check on me yourself. And if, by the way, if you do find anything that you think is an error or out of context, if you would email me on the site, I would appreciate it because I always like to correct stuff and, or, or, or improve anything. In fact, uh, we do have uh, three, three web, websites, uh, historycart.com, uh, muslimhope.com, which deals with Islam, but also another one, Bible Query. Dot org. It answers like 7,700 or so questions on the Bible. Right, so for Bible questions, things of that. Historycart.com, though, mm -hmm. basically covers the early church writings. Uh, early, and things church, of early church history covers uh, uh, Muslim history, too, and, uh, and history in general also. Very good. So we've got three sites for anyone. To, and, of course, the invite to, to email Steve is there. Mm -hmm. Well, with that said, uh, we're going to start show number 14 in this continuing series on early church history. Uh, 14 shows now, time just flies by, you know. Uh, but uh, we've been covering the whole gamut of uh, the teachings of the early church and seeing how if the early church beliefs and teachings relate all the way down to us in the 21st century. And as we found through this survey of things, uh, it actually does. It, it, uh, the early church believes the same things as we do as Christians today as we adhere to the Word of God, the Bible. Uh, most of your other religions are going to attack the Bible, denigrate the Bible, say the Bible's no good, but as we find from the writings of the early church that they believe what the Bible taught, and as true Christians, as serious Christians, we are going to take the Bible seriously and believe what it teaches as well. And if you don't adhere to the Word of God as taught by the early church, the Bible, the prophets, uh, Jesus Christ, and so forth, then, of course, you, you really should be calling yourself a Christian. And uh, this is part of the reason we're doing these things is, is Christianity reliable? Is there a historical basis for it? As I've said many times, yes, there is. That's just one of the, the uh, uh, apologetic evidences for the reliability of Scripture is early church history, which, uh, which verifies what the Bible says. Uh, we also have hundreds of fulfilled Bible prophecies, actually thousands 
fulfilled Bible prophecies, which shows the supernatural aspects of the Bible. We have archaeological evidence, which proves that all the, pa the people, places, and things mentioned in the Bible are real people, places, and things. And, of course, we have the manuscript evidence for the Bible going back in time, and we have texts and, and documents, uh, parchments preserved in different museums and things, Dead Sea Scrolls. We have all that at our disposal, too. But really, the bottom line is, no matter how much evidence you have, and there's plenty of it for the Christian faith, it still comes down to the power of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, through a born-again experience that Jesus said must take place in your life, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, in order for you to experience uh, an intimate relationship with the living and true God. But uh, with all that said, let's go back to the topic today, which is show number 14 in our series on early church history. Steve, why don't you pick up where we left off from last time and just take us on through. Okay, well, we, we were uh, di dis discussing the church, specifically how Christians assembled together. Uh, we hadn't gotten into church leadership yet, though we're just about to. And one thing that they had that uh, many Orthodox and, Ca and Roman Catholic might disagree with is the early church taught that there's no worshiping of the true God through images. And seven writers talked about that. You know, in, in the Ten Commandments, you shouldn't have any other gods, you, you, you know, before the Lord, but you also shouldn't make any graven images. And that may be kind of a forgotten truth in many churches, but it was known by the early Christians, and it was clear in the Bible, too, that you're not supposed to worship the true God through an image, okay? Now, uh, that, would, that would fly in the face, uh, as you stated there, in a lot of uh, Roman Catholic churches, so particularly out... I guess in Spain and in Europe and things, you go into some of these cathedrals and they have a mummified body of some saint that had mm -hmm. died years ago and they've got all these relics and then they've got all these statues everywhere and candles and, and things of this nature. And all this is in conjunction with a, uh, a sense of participating in worship of right, God. Right. But that is uh, an absolute violation of what you just said about right. what the scripture teaches us in Deuteronomy chapter 4, also in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments and so forth about graven images. You go into some of these places, these cathedrals, and there's graven images everywhere. Right. And, and, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that, well, if, if God were to say no graven images, maybe he didn't want graven images, and, and early Christians could figure that out. That's right. And so the early church is clearly stating that you're not to have graven images. So a Roman Catholic apologist, let's say, couldn't go back and say, well, the early church practiced graven images. Yeah, the, the, the They'd only, have nothing to stand on. Well, the only thing a Roman Catholic apologist could do is after Nicaea, after they've had all these pagan temples that they didn't want the pagans to use anymore and they could use statues and things like that, mm -hmm. then you saw that, 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 that come in at a later time and it came in really big so time. He could, so he could argue... Or, Church history, but after 325. Yeah, not 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 but early not church before. history. Okay. Defining early church history as as prior to Nicaea. Right. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So to give you some examples of some of the points about assembling together, A11 was mentioning the word Easter, and so Hippolytus criticized quarter decimians, and these were Christians who thought that Easter should be celebrated at the same time as the Jews celebrate Passover. Yet he later mediated a dispute between the Roman bishop and the quarter of Simeon, where each part of the church could basically celebrate Easter how they wanted to. So obviously, if he mediated a dispute on when to celebrate Easter, everyone celebrated Easter. All right, so for someone to say that this was a later invention or came from, you know, uh, medieval stuff or German or, or whatever mythology is a false statement because way back then they were celebrating Easter. Mm -hmm. Okay, for A13, uh, which is shunning alleged believers persisting in, in sin, Tertullian, who wrote 200 to 240 A.D., says we're not to communicate or eat with a person who is defiled by sins. And that's a paraphrase from the Five Books Against Marcion, Book 4, Chapter 9, page 356. Okay, uh, for, for D. Tan, no worshiping God through images, and Theophilus to Autolycus, he quotes Exodus 23, saying we should not make to God any graven image. So the context here is not uh, pagan statues, but, it, but it's, it's an image to God, and he says we shouldn't do that. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that might be thought to be in early church writings, but actually is not. The service should be in Latin or Greek, which some kind of hold out Catholics, Roman Catholics, uh, believe it ought to be in Latin, even though the Catholic Church itself now says that no, it can be in the native language. They didn't have any kind of that there. They never any indication that they worshipped what was bread and wine. 
Okay, so a quick thing, there's a view that Lutherans have called consubstantiation that says after the bread and wine are, are blessed, they remain bread and wine, but they're also the body and blood of the Lord. There is a transubstantiation that the Roman Catholic Church teaches they become the body and blood of the Lord and they're no longer bread and wine. And then there's a Protestant view that says they remain bread and wine and they are symbolic of a representative of the body and, and, and blood of Christ, but they aren't the body and blood of Christ. Okay, so the early church, Irenaeus, for example, uh, said it was not uh, really the, the body and blood of the Lord. Uh, others there did teach uh, something that could either be consubstantiation or transubstantiation, but there was nothing in the early church about worshiping that. Or bowing down to it, or 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 anything else. Genuflecting because of the host being up there in right. the box. Right. Not a single writer has any re record about that. So that's that's a, a key point in the sense that here here you have uh, almost a billion Roman Catholics out in the world uh, taking the Roman Mass, and of course that piece of bread, the host, mm -hmm. is considered to the doctrine their doctrine, the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, as being God Himself. After the yeah. and, after the and, priest and, blesses and, and, and worshiping that, yeah. that we're saying that worshiping that piece of bread yes. is an invention of the Middle Ages. We can't find anybody who worshipped that bread prior to Nicaea. And I say that having read every single page, I I am able to read uh, of all the writers. That's prior right. To and as I as I brought out in a debate I had with a Roman Catholic scholar from St. Edward's University in a two-hour televised debate. I mentioned that Roman Catholic Mass with the bread mm -hmm. to him and how they, they say that is God and you're to bow down, you're supposed to worship that piece of bread as God through their doctrine of transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. And I told him, this is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. This is blasphemy. This is not God. This is a piece of bread. Just because I say this piece of bread is God does not make it God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Boy, did he get mad. I thought he was going to blow a blood vessel during that debate. Uh, but the, 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 because for him, it is God when, when it's blessed because it's part of his doctrine, which makes, in my opinion, anyone that would make a piece of bread God, to me, that's patent idolatry. Mm -hmm. That is idolatry to say a piece of bread or anything made is God. But here you have the early church, as Steve has documented, saying nothing about worshiping any kind of man-made piece of physical material or right. anything else. Right. So. Now, now, to make a qualification here, though we're not Lutherans, um, it, the, some in the early church, they did teach that it would remain bread and wine, but it would also be the body of blood in Christ. So, so there is a little, not for writers, but there is a little bit of support for that view, you know, we have to admit. Okay, uh, the other thing is that what do you do if you believe it is God himself and all the and there's some left over? Well, I know in the Episcopal Church, the, the priest is supposed to drink all the wine no matter how much there is. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing like that in the early church. You know, I mean, what if the, is a priest getting drunk for God if he unwillingly is, is taking too much or something? You know, uh, the other thing is uh, to pay a priest when receiving Eucharist. Many times in the Mass, people would come... Uh, in some places, uh, it, it would just be like a, a mass, and the, they would get the mass, and they'd uh, place a coin in the priest's hand or something. It's like, well, there's nothing about any kind of monetary transaction for this. Mm -hmm. All right, even the mention of the word mass, uh, there's nothing about the mention of that word prior to Nicaea. All right, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't called a, a mass. It's a later invention. Yeah, it would be Lord's Supper. It, it was called the Eucharist, but it was not called a mass, okay? Uh, baptizing things beside people, like baptizing cars for good luck and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually done uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church or baptizing any inanimate object and not people. There's nothing like that in the early church. Okay. See, basically all you're doing is categorizing a bunch of later inventions. Right. These the, are the, just man-made creations. Barnacles on, on the church. On the that's right, church. as we said in everything. These are just later inventions that, uh, in, in, you know, like a barnacles on a ship going through the sea that attach themselves and they start to weigh down the ship as they get more and more barnacles. And that's exactly what you've got, particularly in a Roman Catholic church, which has added a, a two, you know, <laughs> over a thousand years of barnacles yeah. uh, to their, their ship, which, in my opinion, sank long ago you know, at the Council of Trent <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, in, in many other places in that sense where you end up with a totally different gospel because you've added all these inventions that right. have nothing to do with the early church or the Word of God. Yeah. Anyway, go now, ahead. Now, there are these, the baptizing cars and things beside people. 
I'm not aware of the Roman Catholic Church ever doing that. It, it was actually the Russian Orthodox Church on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, uh, moving on, confirmation of teens. There was nothing like that in the early church uh, about when they reach a certain age, they should be confirmed. There was something else, though, and we don't necessarily completely agree with it. They had a catechumen class that anybody of any age would go to before they were accepted as a church, where they would teach them the, quote, basics of the gospel. But the catechumen class, at least in Alexandria, it lasted for two years. <laughs> so it's like, hmm, that's a long time to be studying before you can be a church. And you remember some people like the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, uh, he talked to Philip, and, and at the end of the conversation he was baptized. It seems like that's kind of getting away from the spirit of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's like you should be baptized, and then you should have not two years, but a lifetime of a class learning that's about right. God. Right, because what you have is just more inventions that are, are contrary to what we find in the Bible. Right. So so often, it's funny, when I first got saved, got born again, and all of a sudden I could read the Bible with understanding for the first time in my life, I started to say, wow, this is different than what I'm used to seeing out here in these churches. Mm -hmm. This isn't the way I've learned things. Or You start to find when you really read the Bible that it is so alien to all these inventions that have infested themselves in, all, in all these various religions and churches. So this is just more evidence of it. Okay. All right, brother, go ahead. Uh, uh, the other is, is there's a, a festival in the Catholic and I think Orthodox Church called the Festival of Annunciation. And there's no uh, mention whatsoever of that uh, prior to Nicaea. Mention of Lent, of giving something up for maybe the 40 days uh, you know, b uh, before Easter, like with Jesus' temptations. That's a Middle Age invention too. There's nothing about that in early church writings. So all of these things, there's, there's nothing about them at all. Uh, so moving on and, and talking, now that we talked about maybe church from a general perspective, we're going to talk about what the, what the early Christians said about church from the leadership perspective. Okay, they talked about that, that you should obey the authority of godly church leaders. Now, right after Nicaea, this was kind of put to the test because many of the uh, godly church bishops were banished by the emperor who put Arian bishops in their place. Okay, but the early church, and, and I guess he thought, well, over time, they'll just get to accept it, and they'll, you know, just, you know, follow what the Arian bishops say. Well, that never happened, and, and as soon as the, the emperor relaxed things and didn't do that, the, uh, and actually when he died, the, then, the, then the Orthodox bishops all came back. But for godly church leaders, they're not contradicting what God directly said. They, they were to be obeyed for, as they guided the church. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that the early church should have unity. Seventeen writers wrote about that. And, but it's not just unity that we want, really. It's unity in Christ. We don't want a false unity. We don't want a unity under an ungodly leader. Uh, the other thing is our excommunicate or separate from heretics. Now, in contrast to before, where you shun believers who believe the right things but are in sin, this is separating from people who, uh, regardless of their moral life, are, are teaching soul-perishing heresies. And 18 writers talked about that. Okay, the concept of a local bishop... Uh, elders or deacons, 41 writers talked about that. And some of them got pretty involved because in some churches you had acolytes, you had singers, uh, you had readers, not everybody could read, and they wanted someone with a good voice to read the Bible. You had subdeacons, you had deaconesses, and we don't know a lot about the specific roles of some of these, but we do know that they did have the, the, the elders, the deacons were under the elders, and they had a, a, a bishop for each locality or, 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 or church. Okay, uh, Church leaders should accept each other to basically confirm each other, and that was almost a protection against heresy, so that when the church, Christians accepted each other, and they wouldn't accept the cults and, and, and other groups, that, that that's how everybody could know that they were one and they were separate. And seven writers talked about that. Okay, rejecting unchristian church leader authority. So if someone happened to become a leader of a church somehow, and they taught bad doctrine, or they weren't supposed to be a church leader there, then they would be rejected. Uh, by the leaders and by everybody else. And that was 13 uh, writers talked about that. Okay, if you had a church leader, maybe he was properly supposed to be there, maybe he was teaching and living right for a while, and then he changed and got involved in gross sin or heresy, then he ought to be removed as a church leader. Okay, uh, six writers talked about that. The concept of one universal church. Uh, many writers uh, said kind of very beautiful things about how we are all one church in Christ. Um, 26 writers either talked about that explicitly or they showed that they had the concept that there's not a whole bunch of little churches go, uh, all around. They're just totally independent, but there's really one church and all the local bodies are expressions of that. Now, they weren't talking about a Roman Catholic church led by... There was nothing about a single leader of the church. 
uh, headquartered in, let's say, uh, Rome at the Vatican. No. They didn't talk anything about that. No. So when they talked about a one universal church, they're just talking about the body of Christ located throughout the world in the different independent churches uh, who comprise the body of Christ in right. that sense. Right, right, right. And, and, and if the church of uh, some town, I, I mean, if the bishop of some town started uh, dallying with uh, bad things or, 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 or heresies or doing wrong, uh, he should be rebuked. And if that town was, um, you know, someplace in the east, they were rebuked. If that town was Rome, at least twice, uh, the bishop there should be rebuked, uh, mm -hmm. but by another bishop, uh, you, you know, which, so, which happens. So this, this Roman Catholic concept of being the true one universal church on the globe, headquartered in the Vatican in Rome, is totally false, prior according to, to church history, early church history prior to 325, right. and according to what the Bible says. In other words, it's another man-made invention, another barnacle added to the ship mm -hmm. uh, that was brought in later. Yeah, the yeah. Pope, the Vatican, all and, that and, stuff and, and, later. And and and, and as to and as to when it was brought in, you could sort of see the process starting to happen. Uh, like at the Council of Nicaea, they kind of said there were kind of four. Uh, uh, maybe a, a, a patriarch might might be a, a, a closer term, but 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 the, but there were f there, there were four. You know, Alexandria, Constantinople, um, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and Rome. And then after that time, it's, you start to have this consolidation. Mm -hmm. And so during this time, of course, they were persecuting non Christians, and things started changing, and they started to weld the power. Then the, 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 then you saw it kind of become a a, 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 a position of power, and bishops would talk about their thrones. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is this is all after Nicaea, after 325 AD. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, the other thing is that churches should greet other churches, so not just on a leader level, but also they they should you know accept and pray for and talk to other churches. There are nine writers wrote about that. Um, there's a tradition of apostles or of the church. So their number one thing was following God, and then over time it kind of shifted maybe a little bit to following the church after Nicaea. But they had the idea that, well, we know it's true because of what the apostles wrote in the Bible, and we also know because of what the successors of the apostles said. Now there was no concept that we can find uh, of papal succession, but there was a concept of apostolic succession. So what that means is that when the apostles um, it, it, uh, uh, appointed uh, bishops in a place, and those bishops appointed bishops after them, and their bishops after them, mm -hmm. that they would say, "This is one reason we know that we're the true bishop, we're the true church, and not some newfangled startup, because mm -hmm. we have the successor uh, uh, of the uh, uh, in various cities, and they had lists of those. Mm -hmm. So they so they did have that, but they didn't necessarily say that you know one one was necessarily uh, better than the other." Now, this kind of comes back to a very basic question. Catholics kind of always like to ask Protestants, well, why wouldn't you want to have something like that? And if the Bishop of Rome claims to be a successor, then why not just go with that? And there are basically two quick answers. One, the, if there was a succession, the succession in Rome was broken. When one pope was a party to having the previous pope murdered, when one pope was tried for heresy. Mm -hmm. And then two, the broader answer, is if the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, and if the church became hellish in massacring entire villages uh, and, 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 and in teaching complete heresies, then that's not the church. Right. right. And so we want to be a part of the one true church, but that ain't it. And the one true church uh, is not an organization. It's not our organization, and it's not any organization. The, uh, the, uh, the one true church is the is a community of believers of all different churches um, who are who are serious about following God, and we may differ on secondary things. The one true church consists of true believers who are Protestant, true believers who are Catholic, true uh, Roman Catholic. That is true blue believers who are Orthodox, and true believers who are Coptic, and maybe a few who are other places. But the true church it it, it has a, a a human who's the head of it, and that head is Jesus Christ. It's right. not anybody else. No one can usurp that position. And the true church is is all those true believers that Steve said who have been born again by the Holy Spirit of God. They're the born again believers that are spread throughout all these churches. Uh, so those are the ones who are in sync with God's word uh, when when they're reading God's word. 
because the, the Spirit himself is the one who communicated that message through the prophets, the apostles, and the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So that's why it all works together. Now, people that don't have the Spirit of Christ... Well, the Bible says they're none of his in Romans. So they don't accept the Bible anyway because they don't have the Spirit of Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And they're not linked together like true believers are throughout the world who have been born again by that supernatural act of God. That's why you don't need the Pope. That's why you don't need the Vatican. You don't need all these other church organizations, the World Council of Churches, or any of that stuff. All you need is Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, right. we've got less than two minutes, so go ahead and get what you can. Okay. Well, <laughs> talk about this concept of, of us being together as one church. Irenaeus, who wrote 182 to 188 AD, said, she, meaning the church, also believes these points, that is, of doctrine, just as if she had but one soul, dot, dot, dot. For the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand out anything different nor do those in Spain, nor those in Gaul, which is modern-day France, nor those in the East, nor those in Egypt, nor those in Libya, nor, and he goes on and on. This is Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1, Chapter 10.2, page 331. So he very much was cognizant of the fact that we're all a part of the same family together. Uh, Tertullian said, But if there be any heresies, dot, 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 let them produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops, running down in due succession from the beginning. To this test, therefore, they will be submitted for proof by those churches who, although they derive not their founder from apostles or apostolic men, as being of much later date, for they are in fact being founded daily, yet, since they agree with the same faith, they are counted as not less apostolic because they are akin in doctrine, dot, dot, dot. Then let all the heresies, when challenged to these two tests by our apostolic church, offer their proof of how they deem themselves to be apostolic. But in truth, they neither are so, nor are they able to prove themselves to be what they are not. Nor are they admitted to peaceful relations and communion by such churches as are in any way connected with the apostles, inasmuch as they are no sense themselves apostolic because of the diversity as to the mysteries of the faith. This is in Prescription Against Heretics, chapter 32, uh, page 258. Now, Tertullian, who himself was a Montanist, not a part of the, of the, uh, of the uh, church at, at Rome, is saying that uh, if a church doesn't have the apostolic succession, or if they don't have the same doctrine as the apostles teach, if they fail either test, they're not part of the church. Right. Well, we've got less than 30 seconds to go here, Steve, so we're going to have to cut this show to the end uh, at this moment. Uh, you've been watching our show number 14 in this continuing series on early church history. Uh, join us again for show number 15 next uh, as we continue in this fascinating survey of this study. Uh, if you have any questions or whatever, call us or write us. We'll be glad to help. I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. God bless you all. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 